Hello, everyone. I am Aydoğan Vatandaş, the editor-in-chief of Politico.com. Today, I have a remarkable guest, a professor Anne Speckhardt from Georgetown University. She is one of the most credible experts on uh, violent extremism and radical terrorist organization. She has written Uh, many books about ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and related uh, organiza- terrorist organization. Uh, Professor Spekar, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be on your uh, podcast. Thank you so much. So um, it's been a long time that we haven't heard uh, about ISIS. So just yesterday, uh, U.S. State Department made an announcement uh, about ISIS, and they talked about their commitment to defeat ISIS. So what do you think about that announcement? Because we were thinking that ISIS has already been defeated. So what is the most uh, recent development about ISIS? Well, I think we have to think about this, about militant jihadist terrorism more generally, and that as long as people know how to manipulate a world religion, it's going to be with us for an awfully long time because there's grievances all around the world. Uh, Muslims are in the billions and uh, uh, the militant jihadist ideology that ISIS uses, Al-Shabaab uses, Boko Haram, uh, Al-Qaeda, it's all a manipulation, uh, a claim that they found the true Islam and that um, in this true version of Islam that you can use your body as a suicide vehicle and that you can kill yourself to kill others and that that will land you in paradise. And that uh, there's a claim that you have to fight jihad, that it's an individual duty, that you have to travel to places where caliphates are declared. You have to live under Sharia law um, and that you have to uh, follow the practice of, I think it's called Walla Wabara, um, uh, you know, mm-hmm. separating yourself from others and declaring them enemies. And none of this is, Um, uh, in my view, and I'm not an Islamic scholar, but I have an Islamic scholar on staff, an inter- uh, accurate interpretation of Islam. Most Muslims wouldn't recognize it as their Islam. But as long as these dis- distortions exist and groups to manipulate grievances and people to follow this ideology, we'll see either ISIS or an offshoot of ISIS Um, for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and we know that ISIS is active in Iraq and Syria. The numbers that are in ISIS are the same as when ISIS uh, started up. So are they still recruiting people from different parts of the world? Are they still successful on this? On this? Some people still travel to Syria, but um, most do not. And the propaganda is urging people to Um, fight back in their home countries to revenge to those militaries in those countries that um, uh, uh, fought against ISIS that declared the uh, that defeated the physical caliphate. So we just saw this ISIS. Well, we don't know if it's an ISIS attack yet, or at least I don't know if it's an ISIS attack yet. But we just saw this attack in Liverpool, and people were putting things together and saying that it was close by where there was a remembrance. Um, a uh, day event, which if if it is ISIS, that would make sense, you know, uh, uh, cause harm to military or relatives of military that helped to defeat uh, the caliphate. And this is exactly what they're calling for. And we saw an attack by militant jihadists in Uganda today. Mm-hmm. So, yes, this is still with us, unfortunately. <laughs> How many uh, terrorists did you interview so far? I have lost track, but I think it's around 800. 800. And, yeah. And then in the last year, I started talking to white supremacists as well. And I wouldn't mm-hmm. say that these people are terrorists, but they're following a vir- virulent ideology, in some cases mixed with religion when they follow Christian identity. And that number is 50. But mm-hmm. yeah, I've talked to quite a few, and I guess I'm pretty good at uh, talking to people that are in violent extremism and terrorism. Mm-hmm. So... Um- As far as I know, you interviewed also uh, Mansour El Garib. So he was claiming to be the ambassador of ISIS to Turkey. 
and he was dealing with uh, communication uh, with the Turkish government and the Turkish intelligence. So uh, what did you learn during this interview from uh, Mr. Mansur al Garib? So what was the uh, communication uh, about between the Turkish government and ISIS? Well, I did this interview um, a while back. I think it was, um, let's see, 2019. And um, it was a very interesting interview. I did it in Iraq. Um, uh, the counterterrorism services in Iraq allowed me to do interviews for our Breaking the ISIS brand, Counter Narrative Project, which is where we interview ISIS people. And then we use the interview, if it's appropriate, to create counter narrative content. So do you think that the Iraqi government allowed you to interview him? Yes. Okay. I was, I was in prison, and um, I think we made 20 or 30 interviews on that trip. And mm -hmm. he was one of them. And um, How did you pick him? How did you pick I, him? I, I didn't pick him. They, they gave me people to interview from ISIS, men and women, and, and uh, youth that were under 18. And um, they brought him in, and... I had no background. They don't share any intel on, with me. And what was interesting is they just sat back and watched me, the, the um, Iraqis. And uh, I think sometimes I find this with uh, security services that allow me into the prisons that they kind of like to watch what I do and, you know, maybe learn a different method because they're interrogators and I'm not an interrogator. I'm a psychologist and uh, I'm not looking for what were your crimes. I'm looking for what motivated you. What were your experiences? How did you get disillusioned? If you did get disillusioned, if you left, how did you leave? And uh, you know how this works basically, but I, I don't care what your crimes are. And if you start telling me your crimes, I, I usually stop you other than to say, yes, you were in ISIS and what your role in ISIS was. Um, in his case, um, he sat down and started telling me about that um, he had come from Morocco, that he had been following, um, Al-Qaeda, jihadi, jihadist ideology and groups on the internet for quite a long time and always dreaming of uh, the groups coming together to form some kind of caliphate and that the brothers had decided that the time was right, that Syria was the right place and time and the brothers had gone ahead of him from Egypt from this internet group and so he decided to make the jump he went to and expecting it to be uh, a utopia and that they were gonna build something good and beautiful and they were gonna protect the Syrian people from Assad. And uh, he told me that his job was doing intakes so that he um, was on the border and he did intakes. So since he was Moroccan and I lived in Belgium for seven years and there were a lot of Belgian Moroccans that had gone and I had interviewed some of them, I mentioned something about the numbers and uh, he right away came back at me and he said, no, no, there were only 333 uh, from Belgium, and there were 5,000 from Morocco. I'm throwing these numbers out and making them up. And, uh, and then he went on to list all these numbers from different countries. And I said, wait a minute, you weren't just an intake guy, and you didn't just have one place on the border. You sound like you know the whole border. And he goes, oh, well, I moved up, and I became in charge of the whole border. And I said, okay. And he continued to tell me <laughs> facts that only an emir would know. So then I said, no, 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 you weren't the North ordinary ISIS guy, you were an emir. And he started laughing. And uh, so from the beginning, this was a guy that was willing to tell a story. And we spent, I think, uh, I spent five hours with him. And we spent maybe an hour and a half talking about all the background in Morocco, what his dreams were, how he was thinking as a jihadist supporter, a jihadist dreamer, and how he finally made that move to to jump on a plane and go somewhere to be in jihad and what he expected it to be and what it actually was. Um, so he, he wasn't sitting down saying, I was an emir, I negotiated these things with Turkey. It came out slowly, slowly over five hours and he just kind of laughed chagrined when I figured out he was an emir. He was like, yeah, I was an emir. And, and you know, it wasn't like he wanted to brag. So this made it more believable, actually, for me. And the other thing that made him believable to me is that the Iraqi guys laughed afterwards. I said, wow, that was quite an interview, and thank you for letting me sit with him for five hours. Um, and they said, yeah, we thought you'd like that one, and um, oh, we're glad you figured out who he really was. And they said, we think he's very cooperative, 
and um, and we consider him extremely credible. So, From- are you are you saying that Iraqi government uh, also knew his connections with the Turkish government? Probably. Um, I, I don't know because don't know they they interrogate um, people on their own, and I'm not privy mm. to that. And I don't ask for their intel. I do my own interviews. Okay. But so what, what, did they, learn? what did you learn from that interview? So what yeah. was he doing? I'll, I'll tell interview? you. Yeah, I'll tell you. But first, I would just want to clarify okay. that they listened to the entire interview and they heard all the relationship with the Turks. And they said that he was very credible, that they trusted him, that he had cooperated, um, that they thought everything he said was true. So I didn't say, did you also get this in your interview? Um, I don't ask those kind of questions because that's mm-hmm. not my place. Uh, it would be two interrogators talking to each other, and I'm not an interrogator. But what he said about the Turkish government is that as he started talking about the border, I asked him, did people leave to go into Turkey to get medical care? And he said, oh, yes, we arranged that with the Turks. So we had um, uh, arrangements with the uh, Turkish intelligence And we would call them if we had somebody that we wanted to send across the border and they would arrange for an ambulance to meet our guy. And, you know, so he would have the border crossing arranged and the ambulance to take him to a hospital. And he said, I, uh, we frequently had meetings either on the Syrian side or on the Turkish side um, with it's MIT, isn't it? Um, With MIT. And Mm -hmm. um, we would um, uh, negotiate. He said, one of the things that, they were getting concerned about was that as time went on, people around the world were starting to understand this whole flow of people going into 40,000 people from 110 countries going into Syria to join all the groups was going through Turkey. So they said, if, if your people are Moroccans from Belgium or Turks from Belgium or uh, Turks from Germany, uh, they can cross the normal border no problem during the day because people that see that from the outside, uh, you know, drone, uh, however they would surveil it, would legitimately think those were Syrians crossing the border. But if they're white guys um, and they don't look Syrian, they need to cross at night and they need to cross in small groups. So they work that out. And that was for Turkey to not look complicit in the foreign fighters coming in. Um, He also said, that the Turks had shut down the water flow into, um, I think it's the Euphrates. Is it the Euphrates? I don't remember. Yes. Uh, That uh, would be in the Topka Dam and the Topka Dam um, provides the electricity. And um, so they needed the water to be um, opened up again and he negotiated water levels with the Turks. He -hmm. said at one point that he was in Ankara and they told him that he would meet President Erdogan. And uh, I have to say that is one of the times when I got kind of flipped out in an interview because I have many times been in Ankara and spoken at the NATO Center of Excellence. And uh, I just kind of lost it for a few minutes and said, what hotel did you stay at? Because I was imagining, you know, could I have stayed at the same hotel as this guy when he was in ISIS? And um, he left and he said, no, no, I was in a... um, I think he said uh, MIT safe house or a military safe house, but he wasn't in a hotel and he didn't meet Erdogan, but he, Mm -hmm. he was told that he would. Let's see what else did they negotiate. Um, It's all in the paper that we've written and I didn't pull that up to look at. Let me see. Um, I don't remember what else. Anything about the weapons, oil, trade. He said weapons they didn't need um, to, to um, get from, they didn't need anybody to give them weapons because they were making so much money from the oil. And, and that too made it really convincing how high up he was in ISIS because he could just spot out budget figures and how the budget worked. And he said, you know, when I first came into prison, I knew all the budget figures. Um, you know, I, I knew them by heart, but I've, that's faded from memory because that wasn't my responsibility. But he, he said that they bought a lot of their weapons from Free Syrian Army, which is such a shame because Free Syrian Army was supplied with weapons by the West. And um, so he said Turkey was not complicit in that, I don't think. Let's see. Yeah, here I have it. I just pulled up the article. He said, actually, we didn't need to get weapons from Turkey. We would get them from the Free Syrian Army. And, um, and that the oil was enough to pay. And I think they sold most of their oil to Syria, but some to Turkey. 
Yeah, so um, Turkey sometimes open an operation in which the management for one battle is 10 million. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. And then crossing the borders, negotiating for water, oil, let's see. Yeah, he said most of the oil went, oh, most of the oil was going to Turkey and just small amounts went to the Bashar regime. And I think that that has been proven by journalists that um, yes. ISIS oil was going into Turkey. And I think President Erdogan's son has now a fleet of ships mm -hmm. um, as a result of that, according to journalists, not according to mm -hmm. my own research. But um, this Abu Mansur was confirming that that, that was um, uh, the market for oil. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see. Uh, oh, and they negotiated, they negotiated for the release of the Turkish diplomats and the mm -hmm. soldiers and citizens. So, you know, there was an awful lot. I mean, it was a bit of a shocking interview, to be honest, mm -hmm. to hear all of this. And then you also have a Turk that um, was an emir that's still in Syrian prison. And I interviewed him as well. And he was one of the guys that traveled with Abu Mansur. I, I interviewed him before I interviewed Abu Mansur, so I couldn't go back and check with him, but he was saying similar things, but he, he didn't tell me about all these negotiations with the Turks because I, di I didn't know to ask. And, you know, sometimes they'll hold things back that if you don't ask them, and I'm not someone that asks a lot of um, mm -hmm. criminal type questions. ISIS also uh, claimed some attacks in Turkey in these years, in uh, between, uh, two, I think it was in 2017 or between 2017 and 19, uh, 2019. And he says that it was actually uh, mid uh, connections in ISIS who were doing these things. Am I correct? So what exactly yeah. did it tell you about these yeah. attacks in Turkey in these years? Yeah, let's see. Well, he says these ISIS attacks in Turkey were directed from Raqqa and the ISIS external, Emni, the Emni is their intelligence organ, ordered it. And that he thought that there were Turkish MIT guys inside the external Emni. And that and these are his, his, his exact words. I suspected that striking at the airport was not for the benefit of ISIS, but tur Turkish groups of ISIS who wanted to strike Turkey or they were affected by other agencies that don't want a relationship between Adala, that's ISIS, and Turkey. Um, it makes no sense otherwise because most of our people came through that airport. The, these orders for these attacks in Turkey were from those MIT guys inside Dala, but not from our political side. They didn't want to destroy er Erdogan, just change his road in the matter of the Syrian issue. They wanted him to use his army to attack Syria and to attack Daula. So basically to push Erdogan into coming into Syria and expanding Erdogan's uh, uh, mm -hmm. possible dream of reclaiming a Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I asked him, is this conspiracy theory? And he said, no, it's not conspiracy theory. And um, he said that, that the Turkish government, after they were in Raqqa, took 40 people out of Raqqa that were part of Turkish security agencies. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, that part, it's what he says. Is it, is it true? Is it not? I don't know. So do you think, Annie, do you think that the American government's intelligence agencies didn't know all these things? What do you think about that? I mean, did they learn all these things from you or did they already know about these things and just let these things happen? Or did they have any disputes uh, with the Turkish government regarding the Turkish government involvement with ISIS? Well, Abu Mansur was um, captured in Syria and our guys took him to Iraq. Americans? So, yes. Americans took him to yeah. Iraq. Okay. Yeah. And high value um, ISIS people are generally taken out of Syria into Iraq and they're interrogated, of course. So I would assume that um, my government knew everything. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't news. And then the reason that I was able to um, interview Abu Mansur, that he was available in CTS, because CTS takes people off the um, the battleground and holds them for a while. And then they go to justice ministry. And once they've been processed through justice ministry, 
they're held in a different facility under a different authority. But someone had requested, a foreign government, and I think it was mine, had requested to speak with him again, probably triangulating on something. With, uh, with Abu Mansur. Yeah, so he was in CTS, and uh, and that's why they threw him to me. Otherwise, I would have never been able to access him through CTS. And um, so I don't know. But again, those are questions that I don't ask because it's not my business. I'm not an interrogator. I'm not right. you know chasing the crimes down. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how did this organization work and how did they recruit? You know, how did why did people respond to them the way they did, and what could we do about it? But, you know, you find out all kinds of things you didn't ask. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, I think the Americans know. Mm -hmm. um, I did meet American interrogators in the prison at the same time I was there. But again, I don't ask them, what are you doing here? You know, what's your business? Because mm -hmm. number one, I don't think they're going to tell me. And number two, I just, you know, it's, it's not what I do. Okay. But Turkey is also a NATO country. Mm -hmm. So... Do you think that American government or NATO reacted to Turkey enough about these things or just kept quiet? Well, I was really disturbed when I found out that um, the journalists that put the information out that uh, Erdogan's son had now a fleet of uh, ships and that oil had been coming in from ISIS for a long time and it was shown in aerial footage. I think that might have been Russians that first published that. Um, I think Russians uh, sent a letter to United Nations about all these ISIS-Turkey relations. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. But anyway, there were a number of things that disturbed me, and I'm sure you know about the... Um, Do you remember which journalists revealed? No, 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 okay. no, I don't remember. But And then you also had um, when the... Um, police discovered what the military were doing, bringing in uh, weapons uh, hidden underneath uh, medicine and trucks. And it was a big uh, mess. And that was, uh, you know, a lot of accusations that that was Gulan behind that. Mm -hmm. um, so there were a number of things where it was coming out as uh, uh, dirty hand and, uh, you know, corruptness. And then the whole world knew that all these ISIS people were going in through Turkey. But I think, you know, bureaucracies are slow. And in the beginning, I think everyone was searching for what is the right partner. And the Americans were drained uh, from being in Iraq, didn't want to put boots on the ground again. And we're thinking, who could be our partner? And I think we're sadly mistaken with the Free Syrian Army which, you know, we speak of as though it was um, some monolith. And we were certainly uh, supporting Turkey when they had these groups in to Turkey to, to equip them. And, but I think Turkey's game was, if you're, if you're a true jihadist, if you're an Islamist, we support you. And um, if you just want to get rid of Assad and you're more democratic leaning, we're less interested in you. At least this is what I've heard from people that I interviewed that went to those meetings in Turkey. And uh, they were upset with that. And they were saying this was when ISIS was first setting up in Raqqa. And um, so I think that the US needed things from Turkey, was working with Turkey. I think everyone was figuring out which groups serve our needs best. And from Erdogan's uh, point of view, the groups that were more Islamist leaning uh, probably served his needs best. And anyone that would fight the Kurds, I mean, he was more interested in fighting the Kurds probably than anything. Right. And, um, and that's disturbing too, when you see when Trump greenlighted Turkey to go into um, Northeast Syria, how many civilians were killed. And now we see the rapes in Afrin and the horrible human rights violations from Turkish backed rebels. But again, you don't see an interest in uh, human rights, uh, rule of law. You see much more of an interest in supporting a certain type of actor, especially if they'll keep the Kurds down. And I, I, you'll never convince me that every Kurd walking is a terrorist. I mean, I'm sure there are Kurdish terrorists, mm -hmm. but um, the ones in Northeast Syria, the SDF, seem like they've you know, really partnered with the US and uh, 
uh, tried to take a stance of, you know, we'll do self-defense, but, you know, Mm -hmm. we're not, we're willing to step away from the PKK to be our own entity. Right. Mm -hmm. My last question, Annie. So I understand that in the past, Turkish government, Turkish intelligence, security services had close relations with ISIS, but is it still that close? Is Is it still going on? Or they distanced themselves from ISIS. How do you see it well, now? I think we have to see everybody on a spectrum. I know of one case, I can't quote the name to you, but I know of the case of someone that came back to the Netherlands and he was being prosecuted for being in ISIS and was going to be put in prison. And one of the things that he said in his defense case was, um, oh, I don't think he was in ISIS. I think he was a foreign fighter. And he said, the group that I was in you supplied weapons to. So how can I be guilty when my country was supplying weapons to this very group? And I thought, wow, he's really got a point. And we see the spectrum with every country that wanted to fight against Assad and that ultimately joined the fight against ISIS, that you see this struggling for who's the right partner and making a lot of mistakes. So my country made a lot of mistakes. Everybody made a lot of mistakes. And we didn't, well, I believe we got the good partner when we partnered with the SDF because, uh, you know, when Kobani was uh, attacked, the Kurds organized and uh, made a really brave fight. And they were willing to be our boots on the ground for our air service. But Turkey did enter the fight to fight ISIS and, um, Mm -hmm. and they did a good job of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, They took over Membij and um, they've done an incredible job. But then we get these mixed messages when they've helped people get out of Camp Al Hole illegally, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when they've uh, backed uh, Turkish rebels that uh, some of them are former ISIS members, uh, spouting out ideology that's militant jihadist ideology. So is Turkey still in bed with ISIS? Uh, Probably not. But, you know, have they cleaned up everything? Probably have a ways to go. Mm-hmm. And, and I hope they, they go the whole way. But mm-hmm. all of our countries made mistakes. Right, right. So, Annie, thank you so much for joining us. It was an incredible interview. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Bye.